name's Paul Sampson from the Policy Research Directorate. Welcome to another edition of the seminar, Environment Canada Seminar Series. Happy to see a lot of people out this morning. We're very fortunate to have James K, Professor James K from the University of Waterloo with us today, who's going to be talking about complex systems theory and ecosystems approaches. And Kerr, who's the manager of our National Environmental Indicators Office, is going to be introducing the speaker in a moment. Let me just say one or two administrative uh, points here. I think everyone's got a good view of the screen. I was going to say if anyone's sitting over here, you might want to move over, but no one's there. Um, on va aussi avoir une, une uh, interprétation en français, bien sûr. Uh, si vous désirez d'écouter en français, les écouteurs sont au fond de la salle sur ma droite. Um, on vous prie de les rendre à la fin de la séance, uh, s'il vous plaît. La séance va être en anglais. Um, just in terms of the format, it will be approximately 45 minute presentation, followed by the, the usual 45 minutes plus of questions and answers. Um, without further ado, here's Anne Kerr. Thanks very much. Good morning. It's my particular pleasure to introduce Dr. James Kay to you not only because of his association with Environment Canada over the years, but because he and I have known each other professionally for a number of years, and we also share the same alma mater, the University of Waterloo. James Kay is an Associate Professor of Environment and Resource Studies at the University of Waterloo, and he has cross appointments in Systems Design Engineering the school and the School of Planning, Geography and Management Sciences. His research over the last 25 years has focused on complexity and systems theory and their application to the development of an ecosystem approach as a way of understanding and managing our role in the biosphere. His activities span the full spectrum from research on theoretical and epistemological basis for an ecosystem approach to the formulation of ecosystem ecosystem-based environmental policy to the development of ecosystem monitoring programs and to on-the-ground ecosystem planning, both in the e context of urban, industrial, and natural ecosystems and the greening of institutions. Dr. Kay was really a decade ahead of his time in some of the current work going on in sustainable development indicators. He authored or co-authored papers for the Canadian Environmental Advisory Council, including the concept of ecological integrity, alternative theories of ecology, and the implications for decision support, in, uh, decision support indicators. And he also authored economic, ecological, and decision theory, theories, indicators of ecological sustainable development. In terms of his association with Environment Canada, he advised the department and the North American Commission for Environmental Cooperation on the theoretical basis for state of the environment reporting. And with the collaboration of Rigger and Pup, he developed a framework which was used as the basis for the St. Lawrence Great Lakes chapter in the State of Canada's Environment Report, 1996. He has also developed with colleagues Boyle and Pond a framework for state of the landscape reporting for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and it is currently being used as the basis for the provincial monitoring program that is required under the Ontario Planning Act. Dr. Kay has published numerous papers particularly on complexity and ecosystem dynamics and has chaired, founded and been a member of, advised and worked with numerous organizations. Among these are the University of Waterloo's Greening the Campus Committee, the City of Kitchener's Environment Committee, the Royal Society of Canada, the International Development Research Council of Canada, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, the Network for Inter Ecosystem Sustainability and Health, the United Nations National Science Foundation, Advisory Committee on Environmental Research and Education, and the United Nations Development Program Sustainable, Develop Sustainable Livelihoods Program. Today, Dr. Kay's talk is on complex systems theory and ecosystems approaches. Please welcome Dr. James Kay. Just want to mention, if you're sitting there, you're going to be blocked because I'm going to be standing here. So the, you may want to 
take a minute and move over. There's, I think there's lots of seats up in the back there. So we'll just give people a second to move because they won't see this. Okay, so what I'm going to do this morning is talk about complex systems theory and try and give you a sense of what it's about. Um, I'm not going to talk very much about policy because this morning I'm just trying to set the stage for that and then this afternoon we'll talk more about how this applies to policy in the second talk I'll give after lunch. So basically, to summarize to begin with, um, complex systems involve nonlinear behavior, particularly feedbacks. They involve emergence, they involve attractors and flips between attractors. They involve chaos, they involve nested holarchies which are cross-scale, and they involve self-organization. And generally, those behaviors are not intuitive to people. They don't conform to Newtonian linear causality, um, that sort of mode of reasoning that's the cornerstone of our culture. So for that reason, they're, they're very counterintuitive, they're very disturbing, but at the same time, that's what makes them fun and interesting. So what I'm going to do is go through the notions of attractors and flips, um, the notion of hierarchy, particularly the scale and type and nesting. I'm going to talk very, very briefly, three minutes on thermodynamics, and then I'm going to try and summarize it and pull it together. So we'll start by looking at attractors and flips. This is um, material adapted from Sheffer et al. Um, he's written a book called The uh, Ecology of Shallow Lakes. And over the last 10 years, we've come to realize the way sh shallow lakes organize, like Lake Erie, which is what Henry Regeer and I have written about quite a bit, is that they organize about these attractors and they have flips. So let me explain what that means. If you look at this graph, sorry, I'll just move the mic so I can. If we look at this graph here, and this is the nutrient loading on the system, and this is the turbidity in the water, there are two states that you'll find the lake in. Either the um, benthic state, which is a high water clarity, lots of vegetation growing on the bottom state, or you'll find it in the pelagic state, which is eutrophic, the water's sort of milky, murky, you've got a lot of phytoplankton and lots of large sports fishery. So you find those two different states, and they're mutually exclusive. And probably where we found Lake Erie, just to talk through what happened with Lake Erie, is probably prior to 1950, it was largely in this state. That is, it was a benthic system. The water was clean. You could swim in it. People liked it. And we kept adding nutrients to the system. Okay, and as we added nutrients, the system just stayed the way it was. And that's because it's resilient. What I wanted to reason, I knew I had this up here for a reason. If you think what this is describing is an attractor, and the ideas of an attractor is if you have something that's in a stable situation and you disturb it, it goes back. I don't want to do it too far because it'll fall right off on me. But it's resilient, right? And that's what this graph is showing here, is if you disturb that system away, it will, re like this, it will return. And that's why you use the word attractor to describe it, because the system's attracted to this place and tends to stay there. So that's an attractor. And the way you stay at the attractor is you have these feedback loops. And what happens in Lake Erie, Henry Regeer and I have written up some papers on this, is that when you add nutrients to the system, there's a whole set of biological systems that are very good at extracting those nutrients out of the water column and sticking them in the bottom muck. So you add more nutrients, they get sucked out and put into the, into the bottom muck, and the system just continues happily along. The problem is as you load the nutrients up, it gets to a point where they, there's a maximum rate at which it can remove nutrients from the water column. Once you hit that point, the water starts to get murky, say around here, and as the water gets murky, you get less solar energy going to the bottom, which gives you less energy to run the system, which means it becomes less effective at removing the nutrients, which means you get more nutrients in the water column, which means you get more shading, less energy, and you see the feedback loop that happens, and extremely rapidly, that system collapses. Also, when you get nutrients in the water column, that feeds the algae. So you have those two things going on at once, and the system literally goes flip very fast, and that's what happened to Lake Erie in the 60s when quote unquote Lake Erie died. Actually it didn't die, it just flipped into the eutrophic state very rapidly. And then of course we all said, this is terrible. We, need, we want to get back that nice clean state. 
And we spent a large sum of money on remedial programs. It was billions of dollars, literally, putting in sewage treatment plants, putting agricultural remedial, taking phosphorus out of detergents. I think everybody knows the list of things that happened. But nothing happened. Right, and nothing happened because we were now at this attractor. Now this attractor has a very interesting property. That biological system is very good at extracting the phosphorus from the bottom muck and putting it in the water column. Like taking the nutrients right out and sticking them back. So all that nutrients that got buried for 30 or 40 years was now a resource that it could take out and maintain and conserve in the water column. So when we cut the nutrient supply back, we moved along here, well it just mined it out of the muck and conserved it and made really good use of it. And so we didn't see any change in the system, even though we were doing all that hard work. All right? Very frustrating. And then about 93-ish, um, I was at a, a meeting of us, a group of us who were talking about this, and one of the first people to try and build a systems level model of Lake Erie, and, and he was collecting data over two or three years prior to this, said to us in February, the lake's going to flip back this year which was an amazing prediction. We were all quite dumbstruck that somebody would make a prediction like that. And sure enough, in June, you read for about three weeks all these t stories about all these dead fish washing up on Lake Erie and what catastrophe was happening in Lake Erie and what was going on. Well, all that was going on is the sewage treatment plants and everything else finally worked. And the system just went flip back to this. And when that happens, you get this characteristic die off of fish that we now understand is that flip back and forth between them. Um, if you look at some of the large shallow lakes in Southern California, they do this every few years now that's been documented. It's just the game. So now we're back here. Now the problem is, now that we're back here, there's a whole set of re uh, people who adapted to using this very well, sports fisheries. But a huge sports fisheries industry. And when we flipped here, sports fisheries is part of this uh, sort of dirty, murky water and pelagic system. I mean, pelagic fish are what we like. We don't like bottom feeders, right? So let me explain the differences in the way of thinking. If you think about what I do with my students, they say they all know about stereo systems, right? Amplifiers and things, because they've all got them. So think about this here telling us about the how, how loud you're actually hearing it, and this being the volume control setting on your stereo. But we all know what happens. It's a nice linear system. You turn the volume up, it gets louder. Right? And that's the way the linear world works. And that's the way we think about things. We think about if we make an incremental change, we expect to see an incremental change. So that's a, that's a linear system. And if we turn it down, right, it goes down. A nonlinear amplifier would look like this. You turn it up, it gets loud. You turn it up the same increment, it gets louder than it did the last time. You turn it up the same increment again, it gets even louder than it did the last time. So every time you turn it up, it gets worse by another increment than it did previously. And most of the time, we don't even use nonlinear models. I mean, nonlinear models are fairly challenging, right? But this is the way an, an amplifier that works in the sense of these attractors and flips and self-organization would work. You turn the volume up, you get some sound out. You turn the volume up some more, nothing happens because you've got a system that's stable and maintains itself at its state. Turn it up, turn it up, turn it up, <laughs> nothing happens until you hit that threshold and then you turn it up and it's way too loud, right? And it just takes a single increment to do that. Now the problem is you can't say, oops, too loud and turn it down because it doesn't work that way. Once it's loud, it tends to stay loud and you've got to turn it all the way back down again before it gets quiet. That's the way those systems work. Okay. So he, what happens here is if you add nutrients to the system, nothing happens for a long time, everything looks wonderful, and then just very suddenly it changes, you're there. If you start trying to say, oops, we didn't want to go there and try and do remedial stuff, it's a lot of work to get it back to that point. Now the problem that happened in Lake Erie, and is an ongoing problem, is that the fisheries industry was built around this attractor. And the fisheries industry isn't there. And so if you use that sort of linear incremental model we all tend to use when we say think about the world, what's your response? Well, your response is what is ecologically nonsense is this. You get articles like this in the newspaper with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters saying that they believe we should detune the sewage treatment plant so we put more nutrients into the system. It's given the linear model, it's a perfectly reasonable response. Unfortunately, that's not how the world works. 
And so there's a running gun battle going on with the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission every year for the last five or six years about should we turn this, you know, should we detune the sewage treatment plant? Should we encourage phosphorus loading into the lake in order to get the fisheries back? Well, the problem is we're here now. If you want to go back to this, you've got to load the nutrients back to the bad old days of the 50s and 60s in order to get it back. So it's a, it's a different way of thinking and you see it reflected in policy and management issues. Okay, and, and, uh, and we still run into, I mean, one of my colleagues was two weeks ago, or two days ago talking to people who were doing management around Lake Erie and some of them broached the subject, well, maybe we should detune these sewage treatment plants and get a little more nutrient loading into the lake. And then you have to say, no, that's not the way it works. So the implications of these ideas of tractors and flips. Well, it appears now, I mean, 15 years ago, and I, and I wrote a paper in, on an ecological integrity in 91, where the sense was, if you did get a flip, it was permanent. Now we have a sense that systems flip back and forth all the time. It's normal behavior. And, and that appears to happen rather than slow, continuous change. That's the way these systems evolve. They're organized about an attractor, they tend to sit there, and if you think about that water bottle sitting there, they'll just sit there until there's too much going on, and they'll flip to the other state, and then they'll sit there. It's not a nice, smooth, continuous thing. Now, if you look at global climate change, there's been work going on since 93 on this, and if you look at these papers in science, there's evidence now of eight flips in, the cl in climate change. And these are changes of mean temperature of, de of 10 degrees C in less than a decade. Right? It appears that 15,000 years ago there was an increase of 16 degrees C in 20 years. So our sense of the climate now, or, or the climate system, is that it is organized about attractors and you don't see smooth incremental change, but rather you see rapid reorganizations in the system in very short time periods. So how long does it take for an ice age to happen? Not 10,000 years, 10 years, 15 years, something like that. That's what the evidence is starting to suggest. So that, of course, puts a completely different spin on what you think about when you think about climate change. You're not worried about means, per se, and slow incremental change. So the, the idea here is that incremental external change, pollution, whatever, may not result in incremental change in an ecosystem. In fact, it may appear that there's been no effect on the ecosystem, so no problem may be perceived. However, if a threshold is reached, a very small external change will cause dramatic ecosystem change, and then it's too late. Right. Um, ecosystems are organized about attractors. They're maintained at attractors by these feedback loops. And feedback, feedback loops cannot be explained by linear cause and effect relationships. That's the traditional mechanical explanations that we use. That's because in a feedback loop, the effect is part of the cause. So you can't tease apart cause and effect. And generally when you look at an attractor, each one has its own set of species, communities, and interrelationships, and what we refer to as a canon, which is a set of rules and emergent properties associated with it. Thus each attractor will require a very different model to describe it. And then the question becomes, how do you connect these models? Because they're very different. Now, this, this language here is just telling you something that ecologically you know intuitively. We all know when we see a maple beech forest, right? That's one attractor. We all know when we see a, a benthic ecosystem or a benthic lake. That, you know, we have those terms in our language, we just haven't thought through what they meant, because we all know intuitively that these systems tend to establish themselves and set themselves up in a particular set of relationships that's self-perpetuating. And that's basically all we're saying, except that the change between those is not incremental and, and smooth, it's these flips. Um, there's more than one possible attractor in a given situation, and that means that you don't have an ecologically preferred state for a system. One of the situations we're dealing with there, in a natural area, we have the possibility of a swamp or um, a marsh or uh, upland forest in this situation. And, the, and it's all a function of the drainage patterns into it. If it gets too wet, we'll have a, a, a marsh. Um, we have a maple swamp there now because it's intermediate flooding, but if we don't get the flooding and we get drying out, it'll become an upland forest. So the same piece of landscape can be three different things, and what's there is a function of the flooding history. Right? So you can have a, a year where you have extremely bad f flooding, and that one year will knock the maple swamp out because it gets too wet. If it's more than 30 or 40 percent of the year that, it's under, that the maple are underwater, they just fall over. And then you'll have a, a, a marsh there for decades 
because of what happened one year, right? So modeling can't tell us what the right ecosystem is in a given situation. Um, and that's something that has a lot of implications for talking about ecosystem health and ecosystem integrity. And the ability to model and predict flips is really problematic. We don't know how to do it. That's the frontier of the work we're doing. And yet that's exactly what decision makers need to know about. So the question is, given we haven't, we're nowhere near having the science to talk about that, although it's, it's in a lot better shape than it was 10 years ago, um, what do you do? Well, that argues immediately for the precautionary principle. Um, okay, let me show you a video. We'll talk about chaos theory. Okay, so here, here's a very simple mechanical device, a double pendulum. They count the number of times it flips around. Okay, and you'll see each and every time I'll start it at the same point, right there, and count the number of times it goes like this or like that. It starts at exactly the same place, close as I can get it anyway, and you'll see each time the behavior is very different. In fact, I made this movie because the behavior can be so different that sometimes I was, did talks like this and the ruddy thing, I'd run it 10 times and it wouldn't flip once. <laughs> so I'm sitting there looking pretty silly. Now you see its behavior is very different every time. Right, three times around that way that time. So again, this is a very simple physical system and I cannot predict what it's gonna do. Right, and that's the root of what chaos theory is about is that there are, that in any situation there's a limit to our ability to predict. This is an extreme situation where I can't predict anything. There are other situations where I can predict for as, you know, fairly accurately, as accurately as I want to, for as long as I want to. But most ecological systems are in the middle. You can predict for a while, but. Okay, so, if we just go back. Oh yeah, if you want to play with these, there's a really nice um, set of these you can play with on the web at that website. And I should point out, these, um, these overheads are on my website if anybody wants to download them and look at them. They're in Acrobat PDF, so you don't need to scribble everything down. It's all there. You can just download it later on. But uh, it lets you set, start two double pendulums with extremely small differences in the initial conditions, like hundreds of a radiant. And after two minutes, they're off doing completely different things. Right? So the idea is this. Um, if we have a prediction, which is in red, and the green is, the, sorry, the blue is our uncertainty, then as time goes on, our uncertainty increases. And how big that is depends on the particular situation. In the double pendulum, this is effectively straight up and down, right? I can't, you know, any prediction I make, I can make any prediction, it doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> on the other hand, in most situations, it, you have very small error bars, and the question is how does this uncertainty grow over time? That's what we're grappling with. How many of you, I love doing this question with an older audience. I do it with my undergrads and it doesn't get me anywhere. How many of you have been to, um, uh, what are they called? Those places where they project stars onto a, a ceiling, planetarium. How many of you have seen them run what the sky will look like, you know, 10,000 years from now or 20,000 years from now? Ah, okay, there's people in this crowd. You ask undergrads, you know, 18 year olds, and none of them have seen that done because they've stopped doing it. The reason they've stopped doing it is they've realized that the chaotic behavior of the planets is such that you can't predict that far in advance. So there we have the, the quintessential Newtonian situation, and you don't do that in planetariums anymore because it, it isn't actually what it's gonna look like. We don't know what it's gonna look like that far in advance. But, you know, do we care about 10,000 years from now? Probably not. So that's, that's a case where this is sufficiently tight that we're not worried about it. So our ability to forecast and predict is always limited, regardless of how big our computers and how much information we have. For example, for weather forecasts, five to 10 days seems to be the outer limit for prediction, depending where you are on the planet. You know, you can make seasonal forecasts, but they're very rough and very qualitative. And the sense in, in that discipline is that's it. That's as good as it gets. Now this really runs against the grain. Stan Rowe told me a story, he wrote me a letter after one of my publications where he said, I wrote a paper where I submitted, discussed this and had the word not predict everywhere. After, the, after he'd seen the galleys, 
The editor got a hold of it and said, no, no, this has got to be wrong. He took the word not out everywhere. And it got published that way. <laughs> That's how strong our notion of prediction in science is. And of course, he was writing me just, you know, reaffirming me, pull your hair out at this. Okay, so that's attractors and flips. The other important issue I wanted to talk about today is this notion of hierarchies and scale and type. Um, and I want to do this using an example so it'll make some more sense to us. This is a project we worked on in, or are working on in the city of Kitchener uh, called the Huron Natural Area where we've tried to incorporate these ideas in a master planning process. And I won't get into that in too much detail except to describe this notions of scale and type. And you can see, if, if you look at this, what's interesting about it is we've got a class one wetland complex in here, we've got trout stream in here, um, and we've got industrial land here, we've got suburbia here. This line here is the line, the, the city boundary. Everything on this side is scheduled to stay, ag ag you know, it's planned, to zoned to stay agricultural for the next 25 years. And we have subdivisions slotted to go in here, more industrial park here. So the interesting question is, the city uh, is leading this project, and their issue is, well, how can we maintain this, this nice ecosystem and use it for teaching and recreation and stuff and still put in the subdivisions and everything around it? So that becomes the, the interesting question. So w w the first thing you have to do, there's these two notions, scale and type. Scale is the scale you need to look at the situation. And we saw that inside it, we needed to look at it from four different scales. We needed to look at individuals. We needed to look at populations. We needed to look at communities. And we needed to look at the landscape. Now the traditional, I mean, the very first study we had done was a traditional biological study. Anybody can guess what they did? Well, you probably all know, they went in and counted species and gave that to us. And that's a traditional ecological approach. And we went, well, that doesn't help us hardly at all. Right? You need these different perspectives. We also spent a, most of our time thinking about what was going on outside the system. So we, we looked at four scales, the wider system, which in this case is the Straussburg Creek sub-watershed, the Grand River watershed, and then uh, the, the Great Lakes Basin, particularly southwestern Ontario. And that gave us a, a mental map that looked like this, the system, the system being nested. So the, the individuals are, make up communities, the communities make up the landscape, which is what we're looking at, which is within this wider system that's a sub-watershed, which is part of the big watershed, which is in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, so that's the notion of scale, and I'll, I'll give you some examples in a minute, but there's also this issue of type that Tim Allen, if, if you want to read about these ideas, look at Allen and Hoekstra's Toward a Unified Ecology. It's a wonderful treatment, and we use that as the basis for this. And Tim has this diagram he uses, he says, well, if you're looking at a particular piece, I can't use the word landscape, a particular land, you can use different windows to frame how you look at it. So we can look at it as a window of a landscape, that is a bunch of things spatially organized on the land. Or you can look at it in terms of process and functions, the more traditional ecosystem stuff, or looking at energetics and material flows and nutrient cycling, etc. Or another way you can look at it is, is using a, the window of community, which means looking at reproductive populations and how that works. There are all different windows on the same thing, and you need all the windows in order to understand what's happening. There's no preferred perspective. Each of them tells you something important about the system. So we tried to incorporate these different types of perspectives as we were going. And if you want to think about type in a simple way, think of your house and think about describing your house. You'd probably tell me how many rooms were in it and how you live in it. That's one type of perspective. I ask my electrical engineering friends, they'll tell me all about the electrical network in the house. You ask a mechanical engineer, he tells you about the heating system in the house. Right? I ask my architecture friends and they tell me about structure and how the place is composed and what the outside facade looks like. So it's the same physical object but different perspectives and descriptions of them. Right, so that's type. And so the, the really important question when we're doing this is what types of perspectives do we need and what scales? So there, the, the notion of type tells us that there's different windows on the world, different ways of framing it, different perspectives, and understanding comes from these multiple perspectives, particularly when we're dealing with environmental problems. And there is no right perspective. They all tell us something. And I think the failure to examine situations from different perspectives is at the root of many environmental issues. So to look at here on natural area, first off, we, we, had to, we divided this into management units. Now the interesting thing here is the management units were not divided on the basis of the ecological similarity. They were divided up on the basis of the management strategy we were going to use. So different areas, this is all the, the creek area, and we used 
one management strategy for all of that. The wetland and its associated areas had a particular strategy. These are regenerating areas, so they needed a particular strategy. So even though there might be 10 or 15 different kinds of ecological communities there, the management strategy was going to be essentially the same. So we used that to divide them up. So that was our scaling at that level. And then for each management unit, we looked at it from different types of perspectives. So for example, this particular management unit, we, we looked at property ownership, which is a social perspective. We looked at it in terms of landscape type. This one happens to be the same. The different kinds of community units, you can see the very different kinds of community units in there. The list is down here and you probably can't read it, but it's, it's things like um, dry meadows and deciduous woods and uh, coniferous woods. There's a whole mishmash of ecological units. Um, surface soils, uh, the slopes, so these are different kinds of perspectives that had to be integrated to understand what was going on. Um, but what we found is we spent most of our time thinking about what was going on outside the system. And the reason for that is that if you've got a self-organizing system, if you maintain the external context, it'll basically just keep on trucking. So for the first thing we looked at, not surprisingly, because we were interested in the wetland and the trout stream, was surface water. What are the surface water flows into this situation? And it, and it just happened that this sub-watershed was the first one in North America to have a master plan made for it. So we had very good data. It was the first one in North America and the third one in, on the planet. So we had very good information about surface water. And, and what we realized is what we have to do is it, whatever goes, happens in here, you want to maintain the same kind of surface water. So that meant a lot of work was done by our architects who were involved about what kind of subdivisions could you put in here and still maintain the surface water flows? What kind of design constraints did you have to have on the subdivision? Right? So we spent a lot of time thinking through surface water. Um, another perspective on this, well, I'll get to groundwater in a minute, sorry. Another perspective, this is the same sub-watershed, this is the Huron Natural Area, but this is the landscape ecology perspective. You can see there's lots of green space around. And we have deer in here, and the only reason we have deer in here, because this is 150 hectares, is because we've got all connectivity to all these other areas. So we had to think about how do we maintain that spatial connectivity given there are subdivisions and things going on. Um, another issue, well, surface water, is groundwater. Well, the one of the first questions I asked, and this happens all the time when we do this kind of stuff, I said, well, where's the aquifer? I mean, we've, we've got a trout stream there. It's fed by seepage. You need the cold water flow in in order to maintain the trout stream, otherwise you lose the trout. So where's the aquifer? And what do we have to think about in terms of the aquifer? Now I live in Kitchener-Waterloo. The largest municipality in North America is still essentially dependent on groundwater. So I figured we had all the aquifers mapped out and knew where everything was. And I was really shocked because the regional engineer said, we don't know where the aquifers are. They had no clue where the aquifer boundaries were. Right? So we actually had to take a sort of interrupt in the project while well, a consulting firm spent two years doing all the boreholes and things so that we knew what the aquifer was because we couldn't move forward without understanding the aquifer. And that was a two-year interruption. And this is the kind of thing I find all the time when we take these complex systems perspectives is that in the situations, people can tell you about what's going on in a woodlot. They can tell you about all the individual species and all the interactions. They can tell you what's going on in southwestern Ontario. But the self, all the self-organizing activities happening in the middle. And generally, people don't know about that. They're not thinking about things at that scale. Right? So you ask about, and, and I mean, I have to say, I mean, I'm almost surprised at how profound our ignorance is. Because we know the little details, and we know the big, big picture. We don't know the in-between. In Lake Erie, for example, when we first tried to draw a food web of it, which we still haven't succeeded in doing, when we asked the people at CCIW about this, and I, and I was trying to just get a rough sketch out to start guiding the research project we were doing, they said, I, we can tell you anything you want to know about plankton, and we can tell you anything you want to know about large sports fishery, right, which is the two ends. We can't tell you anything in between. And I said, well, okay, can you, can you give me a list of species? You know, because at least I can go to the literature and start trying to piece together a food web, for, you know, a first approximation from the literature. No. You know, can, well, can you give me a sense of the biomass? No. I mean, they had no sense of the system. They got the big scale, the little scale, and nothing in between. And it was the same, same thing here. They didn't know where the groundwater was. Anyway, when, we, when I brought up the groundwater issue here in our advisory team, which was city engineers and ministry people and you know, all the players at the table, 
The um, city engineer <laughs> let out a very loud expletive deletive <laughs> because he said, you can guess what it was. <laughs> he said, we're thinking about putting a sand and gravel pit in here. And we never thought about how that was going to affect the groundwater, which of course, was, as it turned out, would affect the groundwater flow into here and recharge, which would affect the seepage rates, which would have meant the trout stream would have gone away. So if we hadn't brought up the questions at this scale from different types of perspectives, that sand and gravel pit would have gone in, and two, three years later, people would have been going, there's no trout in the stream, what happened? And it probably wouldn't have made the connection because this is physically a couple of kilometers apart. So they wouldn't have looked that far. So you have to think through different scales and different perspectives. Here's another example at the whole watershed scale. I mean, now we're down to that little black thing there being the Huron natural area. Well, we had this nice trout stream. And one summer we came in and we had beaver ponds, right? Total panic in the management crew. Trap the beaver, get them out of there. So we found ourselves in this ironic situation where in order to preserve this natural area, we have to capture Canada's national animal and remove it. <laughs> okay. Well, the thing is, you can have the beaver and the ponds, or you can have the trout stream, but you can't have both, right? And there was lots of gnashing of teeth about this, and it's still going on. We're still trapping the beaver and taking them out. Um, now, when we presented this to our advisory committee, the biologist from the Grand River watershed said to us, this is no surprise. We said, what do you mean? She says, well, I've been tracking the beaver recolonization up the watershed for the last 10 years. I knew it was going to be in the Euron natural area this summer. We said, thank you. <laughs> well, the problem was, it was obvious to her. She was thinking at this scale, and it was obvious. And we, were th we didn't think to ask the question, and we were thinking, you know, at this scale, and so it didn't occur to us to ask. And we should have. I was kicking myself for not asking that at that scale. And we just did this. Never communicated, because she didn't occur to her to state the obvious. Right? So you have to think these things through at different scales and different perspectives. And even at this scale of all of southwest Ontario, we've got three big issues we've got to worry about for the Huron natural area. Air quality. Kitchener-Waterloo has the worst air quality in, in Canada. Lucky us. The ozone numbers get horrendous. They were up to 60 and 70 on the, on the scale of 0 to 100 this summer. Um, invasive species is an issue. We have to worry about purple loose strife. We have to worry about uh, zebra mussels. And we have to worry a lot about Lyme's disease because um, we have students going into this and we have deer. Right? And we've got Lyme's disease down here and we've got Lyme's disease at Presque Isle and there's Lyme's disease all the way around the lake. So it's only a question of time till it's, it, it's in here. We have to worry about climate change issues. Right? So we have to think things through at the big scale as well. So this is this notion of this nested holons, and at each level, you have to think from different perspectives. So that's a biophysical system, and I thought I'd share with you just a very fast look at some societal systems. We've been doing work, I've been working with David Waldner Taves, and he's got projects running in, in Peru, in uh, Kenya, and in Nepal. And if we look at one of the villages, there's six villages we've been working in, um, in Kenya with, trying to deal with sustainability issues in the village. This is a map, the kind of map you get when you identify all the players and who's connected to whom. And, and one of these, and I can't remember which color is which, I'd have to stare at it for a minute. One of these is a positive feedback and the other is a negative influence. And this is what people said about each other when the project started. So maybe you can just take a second and, and look at that. You know, basically everybody was pointing at everybody else for the source of the problem. Okay, so then what we do is we sit with the community and try and make a diagram that gets at the causality that's going on. So um, the red here are the things which are not, the, the, they're the problems, the issues that are brought forward in the first place. These are things that you can measure. I don't know if you can read the blue. I, from where I'm sitting, I can't, but they're, um, they're exports. They're things like coffee production here, uh, labor export here, and the green are the actors. And again, the dot, the, there's different kinds of arrows depending on whether they're positively or negatively interacting. Now this looks horribly messy, right? The fun thing we found with these is that when you sit down and think these things through this way, often a very elegant solution emerges. For example, one of the villages was really, its primary concern was education of its children. Well, by working this through, we discovered that in order to deal with the education of the children, they needed a better school, and the way to get a better school was to put a better road in to the capital. 
because it turned out that they had lots of produce that was available during the rainy season and the road got washed out in the rainy season so all their produce would rot so they couldn't get it to market right so if you improve the road you can get the produce to market that brings more money into the community the community can then build a school right it's it's that kind of logic so if you just gone in with the, t the perspective of education systems and education specialists you would not have dealt with the problem in in Kathmandu there's a problem of a cyst that gets into humans that you have to worry about they did a mapping like this for that situation and discovered that the solution was composting right so they set up a whole composting program there because composting did several things it provided nutrients that allowed the people to grow vegetation on the ground which was formerly bare which then trapped water which let it percolate into the groundwater so that improved the drinking water quality it also decreased the water flow into the adjacent river which was part of the vector for moving this thing and it also by doing the composting you broke the cycle by which d debris or waste products were thrown directly into the river you composted them instead and so that broke the disease vector right but if you hadn't thought through all the dynamics of that system that fairly simple answer which could be done at the community level at fairly low expense um, you wouldn't have thought of it another one we did there was a problem of uh, health problems in a village where it turned out they had changed the roofing type and the roofing type let particular things in to get at the food supply that then left bugs behind you know viruses and things behind so by changing the way they the material they used to roof the village huts we broke the disease cycle right but in each case it was about drawing these kind of diagrams with the community and getting an understanding of how all the pieces interconnect at the different scales and then seeing where you could make an intervention um, this is what happened after we had the work had been done we they went back and did an interview process to see how people described each other and as you can see there's a very different set of descriptions now people are saying here's what I can do and here's who can help me do it right so you get the community energized so this is in the context of this sort of place based science where you try and integrate all the science and all the understanding and when I say all the understanding I mean expert understanding and local understanding to try and describe the situation so the implications for this is you need descriptions that deal with nesting this notion of holarchies you need different types of descriptions at each scale you need cross scale descriptions and that's something we're not very good at that's, that's really challenging and we need a means of synthesizing the outcomes of the different types of descriptions at different scales into an overall understanding and appreciation of how the situation what the situation is and how it might unfold and this we use the term narratives to describe this sensitive synthesis because it's basically a storytelling telling stories about how the situation might unfold under different circumstances. Okay, so let's talk very briefly about this. But you can't have me speak and not talk about thermodynamics. Uh, okay, here's a very simple self-organizing system, which has all the properties of self-organizing systems. The tornado in the bottle. If you've ever seen me speak before, you've seen the tornado in the bottle. But the idea here is this is what goes on biophysically with a self-organizing system. There are different attractors. When I just do that spin thing, I'm disturbing it into another attractor. You get the self-organizing structure emerge, and the system gets rid of the high-quality energy more quickly. And that's the basic idea. If you're going to have self-organizing systems, biophysical ones, you need a source of high-quality energy. And as the system develops, it gets better and better at taking that high-quality energy, turning it into structure, and getting rid of it more quickly right and you can see what happens when we get the the self-organization occur it drains much more quickly let me just um, skip ahead I can grab that because the other thing I want to show you is that once you get those systems going they're actually surprisingly robust you can disturb them so they even they stop and you'll see it restarts itself so once those attractors get going in a system, they tend to be self-perpetuating. And, and my only point here is that you, if you're going to think through these biophysical systems, you have to think through the thermodynamics of them. That's at the, at the center of self-organization and complexity in biophysical systems. So, okay, so that's that point done. <laughs> you're lucky, you're off the hook. It usually takes me 30 minutes. 
Um, so, so let's just try and summarize what the properties of complex systems are. They're open systems. They're open to material and energy flows. That's at the, the core of them. They're not in equilibrium. They exist in some quasi-steady state, some distance from equilibrium. And if those of you who are familiar with Prigogine's work, he got the Nobel Prize for demonstrating that that was the fact. They're not linear. And that means they behave as a whole, a system. You cannot understand them simply by decomposing them into pieces, which you just add together. Right? There's all that crosstalk and the feedback loops that you have to sort out. That doesn't mean breaking it into pieces and looking at the pieces isn't helpful. It's extremely helpful. But that's not the only thing you do. Right? And it's not sufficient to do that. Um, they're self-organizing. So the, the benthic attractor and the pelagic attractor, they have internal causality. The internal causality being how good they are at either extracting nutrients and maintaining them in the water column or taking the, the nutrients out of the water column and sticking them in the bottom muck. That's the internal causality. And they're not mechanistic, they're self-organizing, which means you have to talk about goals, positive and negative feedback, autocatalysis, which are the self-reinforcing self processes, emergent properties, and surprise. And that's a very different language from the one we usually use. And in fact, in biology, generally speaking, the notion of goal is completely forbidden, right? Because that's teleological. Feedback loops are at the core of this discussion. They exhibit material and energy cycling. Cycling, and especially autocatalytic cycling, self-reinforcing cycling, is intrinsic to the nature of complex systems. And the very process of cycling leads you to organization. And autocatalysis, which is positive feedback, is a powerful organization and selective process. We spend very little time talking about positive feedback. Even in engineering schools, they talk about negative feedback all the time, but you, you find, you're very hard pressed to find textbooks or descriptions of, of positive feedback. Um, they're hierarchical. As I was just saying, the system is nested within a system and is made up of systems. And you can't understand what's going to go on in those systems by focusing on one level, one scale alone, or from one type of perspective. So the real challenge is what scales do we look at, what are the different perspectives we need, and how do we integrate those together. There are multiple steady states. There's not necessarily a unique preferred system state in a given situation. And multiple, so multiple attractors are possible, and the current system state may be as much a function of a historical accident as anything else. You know, did it flood one year, 35 years ago, and that's what's determined what's on the landscape right now. Right? They're, they're, the question of dynamic stability is there. You know, equilibrium points may not exist for the system. Holling's shown that there's some ecological systems that don't have an equilibrium point. They're in this constant dynamic movement. Catastrophic behavior is the norm. Bifurcations, those moments where the system can go this way or it can go that way, and you don't know which way it's going to go. Flips, these sudden discontinuities and rapid change. I didn't talk about Holling's four box, but this, this notion of shifting steady state mosaic. And then there's chaos theory. Our ability to forecast and predict is always limited. Doesn't matter how big our computers are. So the problematic of complexity that we have to deal with is this. Three things make a system complex for me. Irreducible uncertainty. Right? So there's some uncertainty there that you can't eliminate no matter how good your knowledge is. Multiple attractors, and the system is hierarchical. In other words, multi-scale, multi-perspective, and nested. Those three things together are what characterize a complex system. And you have to be very careful to not, to not confuse complicated with complex. You can have a very complicated situation, which if you've got a big enough computer, you can describe exactly what's happening. That's not a complex situation. And on the other hand, you can have complex situations that are not as complicated as you might think. Right? But there is irreducible uncertainty in, in the multiple attractor situation. Now, I mean, that's the bad news. But at the same time, there's good news in here. Because if you know what your uncertainty is, you can plan to work within that. And it may not be too big. And when I say there's multiple attractors, most ecological systems, it's not 50. It's three or four or five. So the range of possibilities is not that big. But there isn't one. Right? So the reality then is we've got to deal with irreducible uncertainty, emergence and surprise, and the lack of a preferential perspective. And the reality that life is a trade-off. I mean, there are different trade-offs with these different perspectives and different attractors. If you've got the benthic ecosystem in Lake Erie, it's nice and clean and wonderful for swimming, but sucks for sports fishery. 
And if you've got the pelagic system, it's great for the people doing sports fishery and really lousy for the people who want nice, clean smelling water to swim in. I mean, it's a trade-off. In the Huron Natural Area, we can have beaver, we can have trout. And they both got their pluses and minuses. Um, we no longer have the luxury of dealing with problems for which reductionist, the reductionist scientific method is sufficient. And predictability and the ability to anticipate are the hallmarks of success. I mean, that's, those are the hallmarks we tend to use. That's our quality measure, and they don't cut it anymore. I, I saw this wonderful presentation a year ago on modeling. Uh, I went to a, a seminar, a three-day workshop in Montreal on complex systems and modeling. And I saw the most exquisite model I've ever seen in my life. As a matter of fact, it got me convinced I should get back into modeling. It was so good. But I was really thrilled because at the end, the fellow put up a single slide. And he said, if you think you're going to use my model for prediction, you don't get it. Because you can't use the model for prediction. You can only use it to explore possibilities. Right? And of course, that immediately opens up the can of worms. Well, if you can only use it to explore possibilities and not to make predictions, how do you verify the model? Which is what the whole the workshop got into discussing for about an hour. Well, these are the kind of problems that emerge. And, and so it's about possibilities, not prediction. And it means adapting as the situation unfolds instead of anticipating and controlling the situation. So the challenge is to bring together all the players, the scientists and non-scientists alike, deal with irreducible certainty and unavoidable surprise, synthesize different viewpoints and types of understanding at different scales, produce narratives about how the future ought and might unfold, and just keep in mind, there's no right answer, no solution, just resolution of trade-offs through neg negotiation and adaptive management. Now, I just want to take a couple of minutes and just talk about um, a methodology we're trying to develop. We're trying to develop a family of methodologies to deal with these kind of situations. And this diagram is, what we're trying to communicate here is you have to bring together the best understanding and, and, and about ecosystems. And I use that in the broad sense of including you know, human cities as ecosystems, as biophysical entities that are moving things around, along with our understanding of what people's concerns are, the issues, the cultures, values, the general vision for what they want, where people want to go, and try and develop a socio-ecological systems description of the situation. Right? And from that description, generate ecological possibilities and what people are interested in and get some scenarios going, some narratives about how the future may evolve. Having done that, this is sort of where understanding comes from, then you have to go through a process of choosing where you're going to try and go. So there has to be a decision-making process that, that interacts with this understanding. And then having chosen where you're going to try and go, you have to design and plan an adaptive program for realizing that. And then you have the, the ongoing adaptive management, which is ties together governance, management, and monitoring in a very different way than it's been tied together in the past. Right? This is sort of a, you can't read that, but here, just, I just wanted to show you things connected here. This is sort of that blown up in the language we use of complex systems. You know, talking about identifying the ecosystem, this, this hierarchical description, talking about attractors, talking about the integrity of the system, trying to synthesize that together in narratives. Here, trying to identify stakeholders and actors, the governance and institutional relationships. Um, walking through something like I showed you, drawing those rich pictures, integrating you know, what's connected to what and what you measure. Defining integrity and sustainability, and you'll notice that that's on this side, not the science side. And try and map these, these concerns and issues into the ecological description and come out with ecological, you know, different scenarios. And then the question is, what self-organizing entity do you want to be promoting on the landscape? I mean, do you want to be pro promoting the beaver? Or do you want to be promoting the trout? Do you want the pelagic system or the benthic system? These are the decisions we need to make. And having made them, we have to know that there's a lot of uncertainty about how it's going to unfold. So you need an ongoing process once you've made a decision of designing a, a program and then implementing this program using ongoing management, where governance is now about the process of learning. The, the term being used here now, which I really like, is collaborative learning systems to describe this activity, where you have a set of people who are taking responsibility for, dis for learning, revisioning, resolving the trade-offs as they emerge, and sort of steering the ship as it goes, to use that analogy. Monitoring, then, is the, the set of sensors that input to the governance process, that tell you how the story's actually unfolding in comparison to how you thought it might unfold. It's sort of like looking where you're going and correcting the, you're steering your car and you're looking out. The monitoring tells you whether you need to steer or not. And, and management then becomes, you know, I always say ecosystem management's an oxymoron. You don't manage ecosystems, you manage people. 
I mean, think about the root of the word management, right? And it's about maintaining the context. So in the Huron Natural Area, we're not going in and managing the Huron Natural Area, we're managing the growth of the subdivisions outside the Huron Natural Area. That's the trick to, to maintaining and preserving the natural area. So the enterprise, as I see it, is that the challenge is to integrate the participatory processes that everyone talks about with traditional disciplinary approaches, the, the physical and social sciences, and complex systems thinking into a framework and methodology that generates a systems description and understanding. And that description then needs to promote and structure debates about interventions in terms of opportunities and constraints for change. Okay. And then that sets the stage for the development of collaborative learning systems and adaptive management which facilitates the ongoing dialogue about a sustainable future. And I just, want to have, just wanted to say, th so this leaves you with this question. So what changes? Well, all of this changes. Our understanding of how the world works, our explanations of how the world works, how we frame a situation, the raison d'etre for what we're doing, the role of the expert in science, who is involved in decision making, management governance and monitoring, and measures of quality. They all change under this regime and this way of thinking. And that's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon, and I wanted to tie this to this afternoon's talk. So thank you very much for listening. And um, if you go to that website, you'll find the talk there and papers and everything else and graduate student theses and the Huron Natural Area Master Plan and everything else is there on the web. Maybe you can just leave that slide up for a minute while people note it down. Uh, we have at least uh, half an hour to 45 minutes for questions and answers, so please use the microphone if you can um, because we're actually taping this session. Thanks.